gonna say I feel like we're besties now after this. What's up, guys? It's me, Salcedo. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Speak Now Pro Wrestling. It is July 21st, and we are breaking down WWE SmackDown here tonight. And man, I am very happy to be back here once again, especially on a Friday night, the most chill podcast of the week. And today's SmackDown was a little bit interesting. There's going to be some interesting stuff to cover, uh, given that some things didn't exactly turn out the way that most of us might have predicted that they would. Would. Plus, we also got a stipulation set for Jey Uso Roman Reigns, which is officially officially happening at SummerSlam in two weeks. I know I can't believe it. SummerSlam is literally two weeks away from now, which is kind of crazy, but we're getting there. Um, okay, but before I get into everything, just a couple of announcements. If you haven't already, uh, please, guys, I know I just said this on the Wednesday podcast, but I want to make sure that for those of you who haven't seen yet, I got a tons of new, uh, I have tons of new interviews that have gone up here on this channel. I was at the uh, Red carpet premiere of Cody Rhodes's new documentary American Nightmare Becoming Cody Rhodes in Atlanta Georgia and I got to interview Cody Rhodes uh check that one out it's gotten such great feedback I also got to talk to Brandy Chelsea Green who is now one half of the women's tag team champions I also spoke with Diamond Dallas Page Kevin Patrick who is the announcer on Raw and um I'm blanking I'm blanking and I also got to talk to uh Matt Cardona I was trying to think I'm like I know I got some more interviews what were the other ones um so those are some of the interviews that i got from that night please check them out they're all really really good some good news bits in there too and then on top of that i also did a brand new interview with eric young and eric young and i had a really really good conversation he kind of talks a little bit about his why he left WWE, which most of you guys already know, but you hear it in his own words. And so you get to hear that portion of it. Uh, he's a really, really good interview, a very, very smart guy. So it was very cool to listen to his insight on just about everything that we talked about regarding Impact Wrestling and his departure from WWE. So all of that is up here on the channel. Also, an unboxing video, AEW All Out 2023 All Elite Crate unboxing video is officially up here on the channel. So like I said, so much stuff is happening. So much content has been going up, all of the podcasts. And then tomorrow, I will be back here uh, to talk about AEW Collision. And then next week, I will also be here for NXT coverage, Dynamite coverage, SmackDown coverage, as well as Collision coverage. And then, of course, heading into SummerSlam. So it is going to be so much. Uh, Richard Martinez wants to know if I watched the documentary. I did watch the documentary already. Um, however, they don't really want us to, um, you know, really give that much information yet on the uh, sometimes they do like embargoes. And this is uh, a thing that a lot of people do, you know, when you, for example, like when critics review movies and things like that, they want it closer to a certain date. So they want those reviews closer to when the documentary is actually going to air. Uh, so that was one of the things that you know, I can't really like go into detail as to like everything that occurred in the documentary. But what I can say is, though, is that it was about a two hour long documentary and it pretty much covered this really nice timeline. It, it was everything, right? Your entire timeline of Cody Rhodes and just his relationship with his father, uh, all of those details, some really great uh, you know, footage that I had never seen before. That was really nice. Really good interviews. Of course, you guys already know uh, Cody Rhodes has said this in multiple interviews, including mine, uh, that he did ask for AEW All In to be covered in this documentary. And there is, uh, that is in there. And so I think that's going to be an interesting topic once the documentary comes out and people see it kind of hearing them uh you know talk about AEW all in so that's something that uh can be shared and overall honestly I just really liked the production aspect of it I thought they got really creative with the way that they visually told this story for Cody Rhodes so I thought that was probably one of my favorite things of the documentary itself I just really liked that it was a good timeline kind of covering all of these different points and different different points of his career and really showing you know everything everything so it was some good stuff in there I really really liked it um all right and so 
let's see uh we gotta let's get into our super chats just a heads up if you guys want to help support this podcast get your question comments or statements read here on the stream uh you're more than welcome to send in a super chat we actually got our first one here from brandon rosen who says i was god <laughs> i was gobsmacked la Knight didn't win why is wwe such a chicken ass company okay so brandon i knew this was going to be the hottest topic of the evening and so we're going to go ahead and get right into it so LA Knight is going to be a big topic on today's show because I, 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 along with plenty of other people, might have assumed that LA Knight was going to win today's match. So WWE has had a United States Championship Invitational match. And basically what they did was they set up two fatal four-way matches. We saw the, the first one last week, which saw Santos Escobar get the win. And I remember saying this, like the second I saw Santos Escobar get the win, and then once we saw everybody else who was in this fatal four-way match, I felt it was a shoe in for LA Knight to win this thing. You know, you had Rey Mysterio, you had Sheamus, you had Cameron Grimes, you had LA Knight. Um, so it really was one of those things where you thought, based on the names and based on the stories and based on everything that's going on and surrounding all of these individuals, you could have pretty much guessed that this was going to be a victory for LA Knight. Well, it wasn't. It was not a victory for LA Knight here today. And uh, I saw immediately a bunch of people on Twitter basically telling me that, you know, they were upset. People were upset because a lot of people really did think that he was going to win today. But instead, the winner of this match was Santos Escobar. So first and foremost, I do want to break down a little bit of the match and what went down and how I felt about it and all of that. So this match here, I thought there was a couple of good moments. However, given the amount of talent that was in this match, given all of the guys that I just named that were in this match, I really truly felt that this could have been a whole lot better. I didn't think this match was great. I thought there was a spot where they did a... um where they had uh, all four men basically do suplex spot off the top rope, right? And the reason why I wasn't too crazy about it was because I thought the lead up into it was really, really messy. And so there were some parts that were okay, but I just really was expecting a whole lot more given the guys that are in this match. Uh, there was a moment where we saw Rey Mysterio do the 619 on Cameron Grimes and Sheamus. That's another thing I do want to say. I really wish given that Cameron Grimes is a new member, clearly he got drafted to the main roster, to SmackDown. And I really don't think they have actually shown us yet. They haven't shown the SmackDown audience just quite yet what Cameron Grimes can do. And I think that he should have been highlighted a little bit more so in this match in terms of just, even if he wasn't going to win, whatever. I do, I did want to see more out of Cameron Grimes here because I feel like we haven't necessarily gotten that just yet on the main roster. So that was another criticism uh, that I had of this. But anyway, so there's a moment where Rey Mysterio is about to get this match won. It's about to be Rey's a victory here. And so then afterwards, we ended up, by the way, I just realized I said Santos Escobar. Oh, my God. It's Friday, guys. It's the most chill podcast of the week, and I already fucked up. Anyways, cue that you fucked up, Chance, everybody. And what's worse is that I realized I fucked up like five minutes later. <laughs> All right. So let me correct myself, by the way, guys. Uh, Santos Escobar, because Santos Escobar does have a match later on with Austin Theory in which he does win. Won last week's match, but this week for this Fatal 4-Way, we had Rey Mysterio win. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. I'm jumping ahead of myself. But anyway, so Rey Mysterio at one point has this match won. But Austin Theory, who was on commentary, comes in and pulls the leg of Rey Mysterio so he doesn't get the victory there just yet okay so hold on he doesn't get it there yet. And then finally, um, so there was no DQ, so he wasn't uh there was no disqualification for that interference by Austin Theory. So Santos sees this is happening. Santos has already qualified for this match last week, right? So Santos comes out and he goes after Austin Theory, basically tries to attack him. And we'll talk more about them in a second. This then the finish of this match, I thought was exciting because I, they really did tease 
they teased here that LA Knight had the victory because the second that those whole shenanigans happened, the second that Rey Mysterio's leg was pulled and he was basically taken out of this match for a split second, you think, okay, here we go. They're going to have LA Knight win. This is how they're going to do it. So LA Knight hits an elbow drop on Cameron Grimes, and I'm thinking, okay, it's over. No. Instead, Sheamus comes in, hits him with a bro kick, and – uh Takes out LA Knight there. Finally, Rey Mysterio makes his way back after having been uh, taken out of the match by Austin Theory. Makes his way back and ends up winning this match. So, the two people making it to the finals is Santos Escobar and Rey Mysterio. That is right. Your two members of the LWO are going to be facing off against each other in the finals of the United States Championship Invitational, and the winner will be facing Austin Theory. Now, for those of you who didn't watch SmackDown are like, wait, what are you talking about, Denise? You just said Santos Escobar defeated Austin Theory. Well, he did. Now you're hearing this right. If you didn't watch SmackDown tonight, you are hearing this right. Santos Escobar and Rey Mysterio are in the finals to face Austin Theory. But we also had a match today between Santos Escobar and Austin Theory. Now, that one was a non-title match. But here we go. This is where I kind of got a little bit irritated with things, all right? I really got a little irritated here because afterwards, so Austin Theory is pissed off. He's pissed off at Santos Escobar for coming after him after he took out Rey Mysterio out of the match, right? So he goes to Pierce and he basically says that he wants a match against Santos Escobar tonight, tonight, but then... Adam Pierce is like, okay, well, we're going to make a title match. You're going to defend your title against Santos Escobar tonight. And I'm thinking, bro, why would you offer that up? If the whole thing here is that we're doing this whole entire invitational to see who's going to face Austin Theory. Am I the only one thinking this? The second that Adam Pierce offered this matchup for the title to Austin Theory, I'm thinking, why? Santos Escobar needs to first defeat Rey Mysterio in order to get this match. Like, that's the whole entire point of the tournament, yet you just offered it right now. Now, granted, of course, Austin Theory, being a heel, he's not going to want to defend his U.S. title. So he tells them, like, no, I don't want to defend it for the title. They still make the match, by the way, but non-title, all right? So we get the match. Between Santos Escobar and Austin Theory, it's not a bad match whatsoever. It has a phenomenal finish, but the finish basically told you everything you needed to know about next week. So, really fun finish. We see a Hurricanrana off the top rope. Santos Escobar nails it really freaking nicely. Austin Theory goes flying. They both go flying. Good stuff. Uh, then Santos gets him with the, with the knees, hits him with the Phantom Driver, and he pins Austin Theory cleanly. One, two, three. Gets the victory. So if they do have, I don't know if they're going to have Rey Mysterio defeat Santos Escobar next week. I don't know if they're going to have Santos defeat Rey. Uh, but either way, chances are it's not looking like uh, we're going to be seeing Santos Escobar actually defeat Austin Theory. And I'm going to circle back to LA Knight right now because I think this is where uh, we're getting. So a lot of people were upset that LA Knight did not win this, that he's not moving further in this invitational. And so I think, now give, keep, keep this in mind, I had originally thought that LA Knight was going to win. So I'm clearly not, <laughs> not making the best predictions here. But I'm thinking that they're kind of just saving this whole LA Knight Austin Theory situation, this whole feud, it feels like they're saving it. And the reason why it feels like they're saving it is because Austin Theory did go in there and pull the leg off of Rey Mysterio, which meant he did not want to wrestle Rey Mysterio. So why did he do that? Who did he want to wrestle? Was he trying to make it so that he did end up wrestling LA Knight? They never really made that entirely clear. That's just an assumption that I'm making based off of what we saw. But it basically tells me uh, that they're going to 
I'm predicting that whoever goes on to face Austin Theory is not going to win. It ain't going to be Santos. It ain't going to be Rey Mysterio. And then somehow, some way, we're finally going to work our way towards a feud between LA Knight and Austin Theory, which already feels like it's begun since they have thrown jabs at each other and they've had had these moments like, you know, these moments where they dog each other or things like that happen between them, right? So that's what I'm thinking is what we're doing here. But the fact that... We didn't see LA Knight win the Money in the Bank, right? And a lot of people wanted him to win the Money in the Bank. And then you don't see him win this United States Championship Invitational. There's a lot of people that are fans of him. There's a lot of people rooting for him. But the way that they keep doing LA Knight kind of dirty here, it's almost like you're giving the people no reason to root for the guy. Because he keeps losing. They haven't given you a reason to justify why you're cheering for this guy and that kind of sucks that kind of sucks for the people out here being like la night la night la night it ain't happening it's like i don't know what their plan is here i'm just assuming that once they get this out of the picture this whole uh austin theory ray mysterio or austin theory santa bar situation Sa santos escobar situation out of the door i think they're gonna circle back to la night but then again who the hell knows i can't I can't predict anything anymore. So here we go. We've got a couple of super chats here, a couple. So let me get to them. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. This one's from Stephen Marchulli, who says the U.S. title becoming a three way. I mean, you could do that. It could be a possibility. Uh, I do think, though, that. <sighs> I think it would be a bigger deal if they did Austin Theory, L.A. Knight one on one at SummerSlam. But I can see them doing a three way here, adding Santos Escobar, for example, so that maybe if LA Knight does win the U.S. title, that he ends up pinning Santos Escobar instead of actually pinning Austin Theory. Because keep in mind, Austin Theory is still a guy that they're putting a lot of, uh, you know, a lot into they're investing into him a whole lot and so i'm wondering if maybe that's what they want to do just to protect him i don't know uh johnny sends in a super chat saying other wrestlers you want to have uh, a documentary of oh my god there's so many i love documentaries by the way like anybody i don't even care like i don't even care if i'm not a fan of a person or a, or if i even know what the documentary is about i'll watch it like i don't even care like i'll watch any documentary and i'm talking about all subjects not just wrestling like i will watch any documentary that looks good uh even if i don't know what the hell it's about before i even go into the documentary uh sheldon jackson sends in a super chat saying i'm watching this while watching death before dishonor athena and willow are the main event tonight also congrats to ozzy open um also setting in uh, becoming champions tonight and Davis after a Davis injury. Yeah, so Davis, um, Mark Davis had been injured for a couple of months now. And so I'm happy to see them kind of get their footing once again. Uh, Athena, and, Athena and Willow, I did see on Twitter that they were going to be main eventing here at uh, Death Before Dishonored. That is huge. Uh, we've talked a whole lot about Willow basically having a really strong year. Uh, we mentioned her being in that main event at New Japan um, – New Japan resurgence, New Japan strong resurgence in Long Beach. And that was a really big moment. And then seeing her win that Owen Hart Cup tournament. I mean, the, the girl is doing a whole lot there. She really is. John Deller says, well, your prediction on Dom was good. Oh, we'll talk about Dominic Mysterio in just a second there. Uh, but yeah, I did predict that he would be NXT North American champion. And there he is, NXT North American champion. So if you guys want to blame anybody at all, you can blame me. I'll take the heat for it. Metalhead for Life sends in a super sticker. Thank you so much to Metalhead for Life for sending this in. And then time Tim Weiner Jr. who says, with Vince in charge, LA Knight is screwed. Well, yeah, there was, you know, all these reports and rumors of long time ago when he came in as Max Dupree that Vince McMahon really wasn't a big fan of his. But man, it seems like if somebody gets over and they don't want them to be over, they ain't going to help to continue pushing them, man. Uh, it's not looking so great right now for LA Knight because even... Like I said, it's just not looking great. I feel like I have to make up all these scenarios for this to happen for Ellie Knight. And it feels like he already had two moments that were kind of not meant for him. But the, here's the thing, though. The Money in the Bank situation, like, I get also why they didn't have him win. Because it was clear that they had all of these creative uh, plans for Damian Priest. It did seem like they had more 
more like they had in mind of what they wanted to do with that. And so I'm like, okay, I get it. I get that one. I know people are going to be like, nah, screw it. If you have somebody that's hot, you run with it. And I do agree with that too. So I feel like you can make the argument for both situations. But at this point, money in the bank is in the past. There's no point in talking about that anymore. Mike Parker said, sends in the super chat saying at some point, LA Knight will get his flowers or they wouldn't be letting him talk and get over with the crowd. Just matter of how it will play out. Exactly. He does come out. He does have a lot of talking moments. Uh, he comes out there and he, uh, you know, they let him actually rejoice in getting those reactions from the crowd. So you do get to see that a whole lot. But again, guys, it's just like, at what point are you going to justify the crowd's reaction? At what point are you going to get that? Because right now, it'll, if I'm out there rooting for LA Knight and I've been rooting every single week at this point, I'm thinking to myself, like if I'm one of those fans, I'm thinking, damn, why the hell am I rooting for at this point? Guy hasn't won anything because they haven't given them anything, any moment there to actually grab a hold of it again, justify the fans cheering for him. So that kind of sucks for him, but hey. What can you do? You've seen this stuff play out before. So, man. Um, all right. Let's see what else we got. We got so many different opinions on this. So let's see what people are saying. This one's from the Kaya put who says, Vince is not the one holding Knight back. He doesn't fit into Triple H's current plans. That can change after SummerSlam. We don't know that for sure, of course. Um, I feel like LA Knight should definitely be having a SummerSlam match. I think I would be shocked if he didn't have a SummerSlam match. I mean, this guy is getting big time reactions, guys. I definitely want to see him have a match at SummerSlam. And for the United States Championship, I just want to see, I don't care. Okay, so if they keep the bout on Austin Theory, fine. But they need to liven things up, man. I don't care who the champion is at this point. I just want the title to actually feel like it means something. I want them to spice things up. Spice up a feud between Austin Theory and LA Knight. I'm good with it. Uh, Grayson Waller's another one. I mean, there are options right there. Heat up Cameron Grimes. I mean, the guy got to the main roster, and there really hasn't been much done with Cameron Grimes, and the guy can freaking go. The guy can go, and he also also has a really great personality. Um, they're doing a somewhat decent job as well with, uh, you know, with Santos Escobar. That's the thing about SmackDown. They have a lot of guys, a lot of freaking options to, you know, move people around, do things. Come on, get it going. Uh, I feel like this is not a um, this is not a roster where there are no options. There are options to heat guys up, especially for this United States championship picture. The options are there. So hopefully we see them. But uh, either way, that was everything that went down with the United States championship invitational. And my apologies for screwing up earlier. We got a super chat here from Metalhead for Life. who says, Denise Salcedo forever. Keep it up. Thank you so much, Metalhead for Life. I appreciate it. Guys, I really wish I would have turned on the AC up in this house because it is freaking hot and it is currently right now let me see 78 degrees outside which means in here it's probably like 80 degrees so i'm dying right now of a metal head for life thank you so much for the super chat all right let's press on from here um <laughs> wait what md89 says denise sounds like a basketball coach right now what do basketball coaches sound like and you're going to have to explain that one to me. You're going to have to explain that one to me, but I'm dying right now with this heat. All right. Charlotte Flair, EO Sky. Let's get into the women's picture here. So this was some good stuff that we got. A lot of different storylines that have been intertwining that we've been seeing the last couple of weeks. Bianca wasn't on the show today. Um, not exactly sure why. Maybe I missed something. I don't know, but she wasn't on the show today. We did have, so again, Charlotte Flair, EO Sky. So, during this, we had Bailey on commentary, and Bailey on commentary is always great because she's always fighting with Michael Cole, calling him an idiot. That's always really, really fun. And during this conversation on commentary, Michael Cole kept bringing up the situation between Bailey and Io Sky, and I felt like they planted a lot of seeds during this during this whole period. Where now I'm starting to think that whenever Io Sky does decide to eventually get the real cash in because she's clearly wanted to cash in plenty of times, but it's never happened. But when she actually does it, 
I have a feeling Bailey is going to be the one to cost EO Sky her cash in. I feel like that's what they somewhat alluded to a lot to tonight. Could be wrong. Who knows? But that's kind of like the vibe that I got from that. Either way. So Charlotte Flair and EO Sky. Here is my opinion on this match. It was interesting because this match had all the ingredients, all the makings of what would constitute a really good match, right? By the way, I love that they gave them plenty of time. Uh, I felt like this wasn't a rush match. A lot of the women's segments lately have been rushed, but it, it kind of worked the first week. The second week, it was a little bit messy, but it still worked. But this really felt like they actually gave them all the time they needed to do this match. But anyways, this match, all of the moves were great, everything. But for some reason, I felt like something was missing here. I felt like they were going through the motions, getting the moves in. But there was never a moment where people were like buzzing for it. And I don't know why. I don't know why. There was just never this moment where you're buzzing for this match. Like you're going, oh my God, like the energy's really picked up. Because the moves and everything was great. Of course, like all the ingredients were in there. But for some reason, this match just never kicked into another gear. For example, a recent a recent example of a really good match that had people buzzing, especially a match that people didn't even really care for in the beginning, was uh, Rhea Ripley and Natalia. So Rhea Ripley and Natalia, that Raw match that they had a couple weeks ago, man, that one was so freaking good. It had people hot. It had people buzzing. It had people going. And... It just had that energy in the actual match. I didn't think Charlotte Flair versus Io Sky had that same energy. All the moves were there and everything that they were doing was there, but the energy wasn't. And so that was one of the things that really stood out to me while watching this. Um, I also did like during this match that I will say what I did like was there was a moment where Io Sky went for a moonsault twice. Both times she didn't get it. Charlotte Flair then eventually tries to go for her moonsault as well. But instead, uh, Io gets her boots up. So I did like that neither woman was able to get their moonsault in on the other one, especially given that both of their moonsaults are highly talked about for both Io and Charlotte Flair. So that was something that I did um, enjoy in this match. Um, eventually, we do end up seeing Charlotte Flair get the actual win here. Um, and again, I really did like that they gave this match time, though I really did appreciate that. But the match that's officially been made, which was what we predicted for SummerSlam is Charlotte Flair versus Bianca Belair versus Asuka. Now, I don't know what my prediction is in terms of whether or not we're going to actually see the title change hands. I, I feel like the story here is Charlotte and Bianca. Last week, we talked about this. We talked about how Charlotte and Bianca were out there, you know, basically wanting to make a match against each other and not even caring about Asuka whatsoever and somewhat sort of disrespecting Asuka by not even really considering her uh, given that she's the actual champion. So I almost feel like that is going to end up costing Charlotte and Bianca. And I do have a feeling as of right now that Asuka is going to retain at SummerSlam. And I hope so because I've said this a million times, but we still need to get Asuka Io. And I feel like right now, Charlotte Bianca, I do think it's complicated. I do think they can tell the story between Charlotte and Bianca without the championship belt. But at the same time, I also feel like I'm wrong when I say that because I do think that the belt would just add so much more. And especially seeing B I would want the payoff to Charlotte and Bianca to be Bianca defeating Charlotte for the belt. And in order to do that, you've got to get the belt on Charlotte. And I know people don't want to see that. People, A lot of people are going to be pissed if they see the belt get back on Charlotte. But for me, the payoff between Charlotte and Bianca is having Bianca defeat Charlotte for the belt. But then again, I don't freaking know because... Oh, it's just too much. It's just too much. Uh, and I do feel bad for Asuka because they really have sort of casted her aside in this whole thing where she's the champion and she's not even the main thing that we're talking about. So that kind of sucks, but we'll see. There is another portion that we need to talk about in regards to the women because Bailey was a part of this match. And I mentioned that she kind of interjected herself into the actual matchup. 
But the way that she ended up being removed from it is interesting because last week we saw Shotzi shave her hair off. She shaved her own hair off and basically scared the bejesus out of Bailey. And so now Bailey is threatened by the psychoticness of Shotzi. So Shotzi, during this match, plays a video on the Tron where you just see her like, you know, all these different cuts and she's acting super psycho and she's mad and she's crazy and she's just saying Bailey's name over and over. And so Bailey gets spooked out and she runs away. Later on in the show, there's a segment where she's backstage in the women's locker room with EO Sky and she gets her luggage. And on her luggage is an image of her, her headshot. And there's literally like a knife put right through it. It's stabbed right through the picture of Bailey. And so I thought that was a really cool touch. I'm liking what they're doing with Shotzi. We talked about her a whole lot last week. Um, and now it's just a matter of seeing how they continue to play this out. But Bailey is definitely the right person to tell this story with uh, for Shotzi because Bailey's really good at this stuff. Um, all right, so that's the stuff with the women. We got a super chat here from Mike who says, I think it's due to how the crowd feels about these wrestlers. EO is a heel who has the fans. EO is a heel who the fans love and can't wait to be a baby face. And Charlotte is a great wrestler, but a terrible face. No, I think regardless if the match would have had that extra something special, I do think people would have reacted regardless of whether or not they want Charlotte to be a face or a heel. Because, uh, again, all the moves were there. Everything was there. It was just that extra element that was missing. But, um... I do think that regardless, the crowd would have definitely gotten into it. Uh, thank you so much to Mike Parker, though, for this very generous super chat. I appreciate you a, a whole, whole lot for all the support you've been giving me. Seriously. Um, and let me make sure I got a couple of more. This one's from Steven. He says, Asuka steals the pin and the triple threat. EO tries to cash in, but Bailey ruins it. Then Asuka and Bailey feud and EO cost Bailey. Then EO and Bailey feud. EO wins. Then we get Asuka and EO. Oh, my gosh. There's so much in here. All right. Let me break down what you said. Okay, so Asuka retains. This is your prediction. Asuka retains at SummerSlam. EO tries to cash in after she retains, but Bailey comes in and ruins it. All right, and then... And then Asuka and Bailey feud with each other, with EO then costing Bailey and then circling back to EO and Bailey. Okay, got you there. Uh, and then leading your way into Asuka and EO. All right. There was a whole lot in there, Steven. I needed a second to break that down. I'm like, wait, let me see this visually. Visually, I love the way that you kind of tied this all in together and basically satisfied everybody with everybody getting a little bit of everything. But you can't forget about Bailey's whole aspect. And this is a whole lot to do with Shotzi. So we can't forget about the Shotzi portion uh, for Bailey. So that's the only thing that's sort of like missing in this picture. But I do like the idea though of Asuka getting her victory at SummerSlam and then EO essentially trying to cash in, but Bailey ruining it. I do like that a whole lot, but we'll see what happens because again, Bailey's now feuding with Shotzi. So it kind of feels like that might save EO. I don't know. I don't know anymore, guys. Psh, I give up. All right, Steven, thank you so much for the super chat, man. Oh, man, trying to break everything down here. All right, and we got so many people sending in all these different pred uh, predictions, but we got some good stuff in here, guys. Like right now, it feels like there's options. There's options right now for the women, too. Like there's all these stories that they can do. You got Charlotte, you got Bailey, you got Asuka, you got Io, you got, uh, sorry, you got Charlotte, Bianca, Asuka, EO, and then Bailey and Shotzi. Like right there, you got three stories alone right there that they can do a whole lot with. So we'll see. Um, all right. And let's go ahead and press on from here. And let's go ahead and get into uh, Rhea and Dominic Mysterio. So Rhea Ripley and Dominic uh, are backstage and they're doing an interview. And during this interview, they're bragging about how Dominic is the brand new NXT North American champion. Now, I said this was going to happen, guys. It was the obvious choice. Like, Dominic Mysterio has been getting so much heat from the crowd. 
And it made sense for them to do this with Dominic to give him the belt. Like I'm, I'm thinking the way that they think. Okay. And the way that they think screams, give Dominic Mysterio the belt, which they did. So now their whole thing that they're doing is that Dominic is, he won the belt with the help of Rhea. And then today he ends up being challenged by Butch for a match. Now in any world, you cannot tell me that Butch would lose to Dominic Mysterio because Butch is a crazy mf okay? Butch is a crazy wrestler. Butch can kick anyone's butt, okay? We're talking about Pete Dunn right now, okay? Heads up. And you cannot come and tell me that Butch would lose to Dominic cleanly, and that did not happen. So Butch challenges Dominic Mysterio. He wants a chance at that NXT North American Championship. Dom's like, nah, I don't have the belt polish. I don't have my gear, which I'm thinking, hello, Wrestling 101, always bring your gear. Everybody knows that. But of course, you know, just to play along with Dominic trying to cower, cower his way out of having an actual match with Butch. So then out of nowhere, Shawn Michaels appears and we had been seeing a lot of NXT talent throughout the night and the stands and the audience, which was nice. We got to see Carmelo. We got to see uh, Tiffany Stratton. And then lo and behold, Shawn Michaels appears and he ends up helping be the one to make this match official because he is, you know, your NXT booker and all of that. So he makes this match official along with Adam Pierce, And we end up getting Butch versus Dominic. And of course, during this match, we see Butch literally beat the crap out of Dominic. He's like twisting his arms. He's twisting his fingers. He's twisting his ears. He's stomping the man. Uh, Pretty much what you would imagine a Butch-Dominic match to look like. But of course, at some point, we get pretty deadly out there. They're pissed off because Sheamus uh, injured Elton. And so they're out there causing shenanigans. This allows, they get kicked out. Ridge Holland, who was out there at one point defending, uh, helping defend his buddy Butch, who was basically outnumbered once Pretty Deadly went out there, runs them off. And so we're left with Rhea Ripley still out there. And she takes the opportunity to basically take out the leg of Pete Dunne. And sorry, Butch. When she takes out the leg out of Butch, Dominic goes in, gets the pin. One, two, three. He wins this match with the help of Rhea Ripley. <sighs> It was the finish was not great. The finish was not great, guys. It was not the I had a problem with the finish because it wasn't believable. OK, uh, it really just was not believable to me, even with the Rhea Ripley portion of it all with her just take her just sweeping out the leg from underneath of uh, Butch. It just wasn't enough to constitute this actual um defeat by Dominic and even then Dominic goes for the cover and then he's too close to the ropes and so he ends up like moving Butch further down and then goes again for the pin and it just did not look good so I didn't like the ending of this match I think like regardless we knew that Dominic they were gonna have to find a way for him to win but I wish that it would have felt more believable in the sense that I did not believe that Butch would lose in that fashion. And so that was the one thing that I had a big time problem with was just I couldn't buy it. Like there should have been something else. Like at one point, um, Rhea tried getting Dominic Mysterio to use a chain. I think had they hit him with a chain. Okay, I would have believed that a lot more. So that was my one struggle with this actual thing here. But um, anyways, that's what we got. Dominic is still NXT North American champion. In fact, he now has a successful title defense against butch all right let's see what we got here we got a super chat here from shots from shotzi <laughs> guys i quit i quit today that's it steven where truly says shotzi's new character is the setup for a future bray tie-in you think i don't know it would be kind of cool but at the same time here's the thing like i would be okay with that but the problem is that with the bray stuff You just never know if it's going to actually work, right? You just never know with all of the stuff that they've been doing with them. And right now what they're doing with Shotzi is working and it's the first thing that's working for her on the main roster. That part of me doesn't want to like gamble and then tie her in with Bray Wyatt and whatever it is that he decides to do when he comes back. And I don't want 
to see Shotzi go down the same path that Alexa Bliss went in. And this is kind of like, this is Shotzi's first big thing on the main roster. So uh, her first real, real story. So I almost don't want to see that be jeopardized. It would be cool, but it would only be cool if it's done right. And you don't want to, again, see her go down the same path that Alexa did. Uh, Steven sends in a super chat saying, I think Shotzi comes in at a later point for when she is done with Io and Asuka. Charlotte and Bianca have their own feud away with the title. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for sending in the super chat, Steven. Um, all right, so, and everybody is also talking about the finish being a little bit botched. Yeah, I know. And that was for the Dominic Butch match, but we'll press on from here. All right. Ah, uh, let's see. Let me make sure that I've got everyone's super chat right now because I don't like when I accidentally miss people, but I've got everybody. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to Bobby Lashley. So we talked a lot about Bobby Lashley last week, especially when we saw him with the street profits. And this week, again, we see him not with the street profits, but instead with Carmelo Hayes and Trick Williams. It's a very, very quick backstage segment. Uh, all that we can make of this is, I don't know, is he recruiting new members for the Hurt Business? Is he scouting new members for the Hurt Business? It seems like he's, I don't know, just talking to people. Talking to people, seeing what's up, seeing what's out there. Uh, I would love that, by the way. Can I just say, like, a really cool stable with, um, you know, Hurt Business 2.0 with Bobby Lashley, Carmelo Hayes, Trick Williams, Street Profits, all of them. I don't care. All of these guys together I think would be really freaking cool, actually. Really freaking cool. Of course, you got our Mel uh, Carmelo Hayes, who's your NXT champion, so he's off doing his thing on NXT. But uh, I don't know. Maybe they could even represent the Hurt business, but on NXT. Like, that would be pretty cool if they did something like that. Where Yeah, they're part of the Hurt business, but they're representing on NXT. I think that would be pretty awesome. And then with maybe some occasional... Uh, appearances by Bobby Lashley, especially since they're doing the whole thing with main roster talent on NXT. I can actually see that working, but either way, I like that we're getting these very, uh, you know, minimal teases with to see who might Bobby Lashley be bringing into uh, possibly starting up a new version of the Hurt Business, or I don't know if they're going to call it something else. No idea. Uh, let's see what else we got here. And, um, all right, we're going to go ahead and move on to our last and final topic of the day. Uh, this is the thing about SmackDown, guys. SmackDown, because it's a two-hour show, we only got we got less to talk about, you know, when it comes to SmackDown. But it's a nice little compact show. All right, um, before we get into um, Roman Reigns and Jey Uso, really quickly, next week we are going to be seeing Rey Mysterio versus Santos Escobar for the finals of the United States Championship Invitational. The winner of that match will go on to face Austin Theory. And then we're also going to be seeing Karrion Cross versus Carl Anderson. And this is based off of the attack that occurred last week, which no one remembered. So I'm here to remind you that we're going to be seeing Karrion Cross versus Carl Anderson. All right, <laughs> let's get into this, everybody. The last and final thing to talk about, and that is the rules of engagement that we saw unfold today with the bloodline. And basically, this was probably, we've been seeing so many segments with the bloodline. They literally are carrying SmackDown each and every single week. They are the highlight. They are the bread and butter of this show. Um, today was no different, but it wasn't as shocking as some of the other moments that we've had. Basically, this was very, very straightforward. And what we got here was Roman Reigns um, going out there and he's supposed to be doing like this rules of engagement. So the whole tease of the night was, will he accept Jay Uso's challenge at SummerSlam? Is he going to say yes? What exactly are the rules of engagement? No freaking idea what that even meant. But uh, I still went into this wondering what they're going to do. And so Roman, the first thing that he does is he looks at Jay and he tells him, do you still want to do this? And Jay says, yes, because you put my brother Jimmy in the hospital and now I need to get you for this. So then Roman is ready to sign this contract, but turns out that Jay slams it and says that you don't actually need to sign this contract. Why? Because the contract is in the blood already. 
In fact, this match between Jey Uso and Roman Reigns is going to be a tribal combat match. A tribal combat match. And Jay explained this is pretty much an anything goes match. Uh, he said anything can happen. Anything goes. This is an anything goes match, but we're calling it a tribal combat match. That is what we're getting here. And Roman looks at him and he says, do the elders know about this? And Jay says, it was their idea. So Roman's pissed. He tells him to shut up. And then this all leads to Solo throwing the table. And then Jay ends up super kicking Solo. And there was also this moment where both Roman Reigns and Jay Uso kind of stop Solo Sokoa from like trying to destroy everything. And then he eventually hits him with a super kick. But it kind of seemed like for a second, Roman and Jay Uso were on the same page, but not in but in a way where they both understood what they had to do where they're making it seem like not only does this winner of the tribal court get the actual title, but the winner of this tribal combat match also becomes the head of the table, becomes the tribal chief, right? So that's the whole thing that they're telling here. So this was really cool. I'm liking this tribal combat stipulation that they put forth for, for, uh, for SummerSlam. I think it's going to add a whole... M- a whole different layer to this story. I don't know if this officially means we're finally going to be seeing other family members from the bloodline appear. Uh, I think at this point, they've already been teased so many times. And last week and this week, already two weeks back to back with them teasing uh, the elders and other family members. Uh, So I don't know if we're not going to see them until SummerSlam or maybe the week before SummerSlam. We only got two weeks, so they really got two shows to do this in. Um, Who the hell knows? But this is Something that I'm looking forward to primarily because I love the stipulation that was added to this. I right now still do not. I don't feel it in my bones in the sense that I don't know that Jey Uso is going to defeat Roman Reigns, guys. I don't feel too confident in that. And what happens from now in the next two weeks and what happens in that match, you know, clearly will change things. But right now I'm not sold that Jey Uso is actually going to defeat Roman Reigns, guys. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I know a lot of people have been asking, is he going to be the one to finally do it? Is this how they're going to end things? Is this how it's going to go? I don't feel like it's going to happen right now. And I could be wrong. Maybe I'll change my mind next week. But right now, July 21st, I don't think so. Am I wrong here? Let's see what we got here. Uh, Let's see what people are going to say. Uh, are saying about this and this is from grande hero who says the only thing that is disappointing about the storyline is that they should have brought in rikishi or someone to set up the match they could have really they could have but who knows they still have time to do that um bryce williams says also blood relatives can't interfere in the match i don't want to see really anyone interfere in this match i mean i can see jimmy maybe interfering in this match sola sokoa interfering in this match But I don't think I would want like anybody else to interfere into this match because it would kind of take away from whoever ends up winning, right? Because the elders are supposed to be like above this, above this family drama. Like they're supposed to be the ones that set them straight, right? That's the way that I see it. They're supposed to be this, you know, clearly this higher authority. There's a hierarchy and you respect your elders and thus they, if they see that, you know, there's drama between Roman and Jay and Jimmy, They have to watch it unfold and should not be intervening in that in the actual physical physical portion of the match. I feel like they can intervene clearly like with words, but not in the actual physical portion of this match. That's just my opinion there. Um, And let's see what else we got here. Uh, We still got more people saying O2 Tenka says he's not the plan. Roman versus Cody. We still got that, guys. But. I'm not that convinced anymore either on that either. Uh, I feel like you still have to. It's so weird because when I was watching the Cody documentary and everybody already knows this, we know that he didn't get to finish his story at WrestleMania 39. We know this and seeing that in the documentary was, I was thinking to myself, how much better would it have been had Cody actually finished his story? And I have a feeling everybody that watches this documentary is going to be thinking that because you're going to see his whole journey play out 
the whole journey. You're going to be sitting there for two hours watching the whole journey. And then come WrestleMania 39, and we all know what happens at WrestleMania 39. And it's one of those things where it's like, damn, it's like the Titanic, you know? You guys know what happens in the Titanic. You don't got a happy ending. That's what it felt like. So we got a super chat here from Joseph uh, Dog Dagon. Thank you so much to Joseph for this very generous super chat. Joseph says, I don't see Roman losing the title at SummerSlam or in the near future. There's no one in SmackDown that's over enough to even or even on par with Cody or uh, Damien. Um, right now, it's still to me, if anybody's going to, and like, I think Jay, because of the story that they've been telling is a huge possibility for Jay to be the one. I really do think if they told, if they, given the story that they told, I really do believe that he could be the one, but there's just something that's just telling me that it's not going to happen. But if it did happen, shit, it would be crazy. Honestly, it would be crazy. It would be so crazy just thinking about everything they had to do to get there. Everything that they had to do to get there. But I actually, I don't even know anymore. I don't even know anymore what else you can do for, if you can't, if Jey Uso does not defeat Roman Reigns at SummerSlam, I don't feel like you can go back and do Jey uh, Uso and Roman Reigns again and then try to justify Jay defeating Roman. So if Roman defeats Jay here at SummerSlam, like that's it. That's it. Close the doors. That is it right there. I'm not expecting to see Jey Uso ever defeat Roman Reigns for the title. Like that is it. And so if he doesn't end up being the one, because he's the closest person besides Cody, Jay's the closest person. And then maybe some of you can even argue Sola Sokoa down the road. Sola Sokoa, I don't see it happening right now. I could see it happening in the future. Not right now. But Sola Sokoa, Jay Uso, Cody Rhodes right now are the only people that I can see uh, it making sense for them to beat Roman Reigns. Cody, you got him trying to finish his story. Jay, you got the whole, you know, last two years that they've been doing with Roman and the bloodline and everything. And then with um, Sola Sokoa, he's like the future, you know? Sola Sokoa is the future. So you can tell that story there too. But again, oh boy, they got some options there. I, I, this is not my official prediction, guys. I got two more weeks to make my official prediction. But as of right now, I don't think it's happening. Joseph, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate you sending this in a whole lot. All right, guys. And I think that's pretty much it for SmackDown, everybody. Um, that was July 21st, WWE SmackDown on FS1. Next week, they will be back on Fox. And like I said, we got two weeks till SummerSlam. And SummerSlam, I will be here doing a watch party, uh, a watch along. So I can't wait to do that with you guys there. But I will be back tomorrow for AEW Collision. So if you're a fan of the show, want to come hang out, want to come chat, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and I will catch you on the next episode of Speak Now Pro Wrestling. Bye, everyone.